Hi, Oav. Welcome, and thanks for joining me here at Entre Capital's Founder Spotlight Series, where we highlight some of the inspiring founders in our portfolio and invite them to share some of the lessons that they've learned along the way. Are you ready to get started? Yes, Faye. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here today. Amazing. Excited to have you. Let's start first with the basics. Uh, tell us a little bit about who you are. Before we jump into guide, in particular, tell us about you, Yoav, as a founder. Cool. So uh, as you said, I'm Yoav. I'm the co-founder and chief product officer in Guide. Actually, I think my first job in high tech was in my ninth grade <laughs> uh, during my summertime when I already working on a startup. And back then I already knew I kind of loved the startup mode and notion. And since then, fast forward to 2010, I think that's where I met uh, Dan, Guide co-founder at Quilt, where I was one of the first employees. And already back then, video was a key element, same as it, it is today in Guide. And uh, probably in the last decade or so, I've been leading different uh, key product position in several Israeli startups, mostly around big data and video. So that's kind of my expertise. And probably on a more personal note, I'm also a big sports fan, uh, mostly football and basketball. So. You can kind of see all the sports reference in our website messaging and even inside our product. And uh, I think uh, coaching a football team is very similar to coaching a startup. So I think there's a lot of lesson we can learn from the sports space to the startup, uh, to the startup space. Uh, yeah, and I know we, we recently published a guest blog from Dan on your team that also focused a lot on that on that topic. And it was actually, it was really interesting to see that. So we'll, let's let's, I want to jump into that a little bit more, especially when it comes to understanding your the team or building a team. Um, but let's jump before we get into the details of that. Can you tell me a little bit about Guide, particularly? Um, just give kind of, I guess, your elevator pitch. What do you do? Who do you offer it to? And how would you kind of classify yourself if you would have to put your 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 offering in some sort of sector? Would you consider yourself enterprise SaaS? Would you consider yourself uh, you know, within the video space, particularly, I guess, how would you identify guide? Cool. So, yeah, so we've get, that's a question we get to ask a lot. So I think, first of all, in a nutshell, guide is kind of reinventing the way you can capture and uh, organize video knowledge, the collective know-how or collective wisdom in, uh, uh, of software, what we call it software enablement, basically how you uh, on board and learn new tools, new new features, and engage with it. So I would say, in a nutshell, guide is reinventing the way that uh, you can capture and organize video knowledge, all the collective know-how of software. We actually call it, we frame it as software enablement, whether it's like product enablement for new product, whether it's employee enablement for onboarding new employees. And we basically allow you to load and ingest any video source you have in the organization, whether it's Zoom teams recording YouTube content, Loom's content, you can also create ad hoc videos with guide and automatically will uh, make it accessible and searchable based on your roles and based on topics. So every question you have, you can find it in two seconds and just watch the relevant micro segment, two minutes video that address that specific question. So are you uh, like creating, what do you say you're creating almost like when someone goes to YouTube and searches how to, you're creating that for an internal system for individual companies, for their employees to understand the how to's without having to, I guess, I search say, on YouTube? Yeah. So I would say today it's kind of divided to two. Uh, some customers are using it internally, some of them externally with their own partners and customers. But the idea is basically to, most of the companies have like tons of Zoom recording or YouTube content that no one ever sees it. It's like nobody have the time or patience to watch a one hour session. So what we basically are, are doing is slicing it or uh, we're slicing it to chapters based on topics and role. And if, if you have a question, how do I price an OEM or how do I use feature X in a new release, I can find the relevant two minutes and watch it, uh, we make it accessible and it's also personalized. So based on who you are and what you're doing right now in Salesforce, in AWS, in GitHub, based on that will surface the relevant content and make it like easily consumable for you. 
Wow. And, and, you know, I guess as a chief product officer within this, it's all, obviously there's a, the idea and the, the concept behind it, but a lot of this is probably very heavy, heavily product focused. And, and when it comes to understanding, I guess, how you thought about building, is there AI involved? Is there, you know, like, I'm just thinking it's not a typical video system. You know, it's not just taking a video and being able to have, a, have a nice interface of it. It seems like there's a lot of backend, like you had said, data or, Correct. So, or, 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 or real heavy tech involved. Can you explain a little bit just before we get in? This is also like just for me, and I'm interested in understanding how, how does it work? Cool. So, yeah, so, so I think uh, in, in general, like we call it smart video, like video uh, have you have both the images and the transcriptions of like the, the speech within the video. So what we do is analyze every video, both we analyze the frames inside what you're showing on the screen, what you're, what that, what you're showing on the presentation. If you're showing a demo, within the demo, what are the topics, URLs, titles, pages, features that you're presenting? That's one aspect. Second aspect is the actual conversation. We're learning like the company kind of own dictionary features, customer names, and so on. And based on what you're talking, what you're presenting, we're gonna analyze it and break it down to topic and chapters, and then we're, we're kind of analyzing also specific events when you're sharing a presentation where a speaker changes. So based on those events and what you're showing and talking about, we can kind of break it down to topics and make it accessible and searchable so you can find what you need. Yeah. Did you start off with that being your purpose? Tell me a little bit about the product market fit. How did you know that this is the direction you wanted to go? Was Did you automatically, when you first started, say, this is who we wanted to target, this is the product that we wanted to offer, or was there a process or a meandering until you got to find that fit and to where you are right now? And I know you're only a year in. So tell me a little bit about how is this coming and how how is your product market fit coming along? Yeah, for sure. So I think when uh, we started to brainstorm the idea or the initial concept a bit after COVID started, and both Dan and I uh, felt firsthand how challenging it is to train new employees or new partners, new customers about new features. And from a product perspective, you're always a kind of a focal point for the field teams and go to market teams about features, requests, on, or demand from the field. So I think what it was clear to us that the shift to remote workplace uh, kind of changed the way we work. Um, in the past, when you had a question, you used to just ask someone face to face. Now, when you have a question, it's usually over email, over Slack, or usually you jump on a Zoom call and uh, with your team members or your team and just address the specific question. So it's it was clear to us that there's like tons of video recordings. Some of them are short forms like Loom. Some of them are like longer from like Zoom or Teams but it's rarely ever used and people just keep asking the same question over and over again. So I think the, 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 the initial goal was instead of copy pasting the same ways you, we used to communicate uh, when we were in the same place and, and, and kind of to shift to more uh, remote communication or asynchronous communication between teams, between time zone, that was kind of one key element. A second trend we saw in the market is the explosion of software. Like 10 years ago, a sales rep had probably like a, an email like Outlook, a CRM like Salesforce and a PowerPoint presentation, that's it. Nowadays, you have more than 40 different tools in your stack for quotes and pricing and pipeline pr prediction. And uh, you have Gong and you have Slack and you have Zoom and a way to automatically send email blasts. So you need to kind of master a lot of tools, but you don't have really the time to learn each one or each individual to master them. So the concept is to be able to bring you like the relevant content you need where you need it. So if I'm on Salesforce, I'll get it in Salesforce. If I'm, if I'm on Outreach, I'll get it in Outreach and only the content is relevant to me because uh, like the same keyword, if I'm a sales rep searching for security, it's, I don't expect the same response if I'm a sales engineer. So based on who you are and what you need, we'll kind of surface the right content on demand. And did you automatically get to the space of utilizing these other tools that already exist, like integrating Zoom, Loom, all these other video platforms per se, or 
did you start off saying, okay, well, we can create our own video platform guide. People can record their video platform and then we'll have that embedded into space, into the space, or are you doing both at the same time? I'm wondering like, how do, how, how, how would you advise someone, obviously not within the same space, um, but someone doing something that could either utilize existing technology or existing tools and then integrate them within their own new platform that kind of syncs it all versus starting from scratch and building it from the ground up. I'd like to understand a little bit about what you guys do and how and why you made that decision, whichever that decision was. Do you understand my question? Yeah, of course. So I think, um, first of all, when, when we started, the initial concept was ju with just to connect to existing video sources, not to mm -hmm. provide an ad hoc recorder that came through, the, uh, through our work with, uh, with our design partners. When we started, we built a quick prototype uh, and we like I think in four to six weeks we started to uh, work with a few design partners, and our goal was to quantify two two main things. First of all, is what persona has the biggest pain point, and second of all, uh, like who has the fastest time to value. Like if I have zero recording and zero videos, it will take me time to record. So the initial time to value we saw that the biggest value was for customer that has a huge library of YouTube, Loom, Zoom, and so on. And then you load everything to guide and suddenly everything is, is searchable and available for you based on topics, based on roles, and the value is pretty instant. It takes us like 10 seconds to process a one minute video. So you can upload hundreds of video and get everything sorted out pretty quickly. Um, and then, while working with the different types of design partners, our goal was to pick at least probably one or two and to focus on messaging and our go to market and, and on those ones uh, specifically. Can you, this is something that I haven't touched upon with anyone else that I'm speaking to. And I think it's a very hot topic, obviously within founders trying to figure out that concept of design partners. Can you tell me a little bit about how did you choose them? How did you, I guess, really make sure that they were focused on what you needed? How did you ensure that there was value? Um, obviously, you know, some design partners are, are really great from the onset and some need to be prodded into getting, so you can know exactly what you would like to get out of them. Can you, as a founder, what role did they play? And obviously you, you mentioned it now that they helped you figure out exactly what the pain points were, but dive a little bit into that process what was maybe difficult about working with some design partners? What was very helpful to you? And would you suggest other founders, how, how would you suggest other founders go about utilizing or working with design partners? And I'm sorry, I know I'm totally going off of what broad topics I had mentioned and told you that we would talk about, but this is, this is kind of where I think is interesting. So if you wanna skip this question, you can say skip, but I think it's very interesting and will be actually really helpful for other founders that are listening to this. No, it's fine. I think, uh, first of all, uh, choosing the right design partners is a key. And usually if you go with a design partners that is in more enterprise versus an SMB, it will totally change the way, like your roadmap and you'll go to market and the messaging. And, uh, and, and so I think that's kind of a crucial element. I think before selecting the right design partners, what Dan and I did is probably interviewed more than 100 potential prospects. We actually had uh, an executive summary of each of an interview. We still have it today. Yeah. And we picked like four or five different personas that we wanted to interview uh, with five, six specific questions. We picked like director level and team leaders of CSM, sales engineering, uh, sales ops, and sales enablement, and uh, VPHR. We wanted to select five different roles that we thought could be a relevant fit for our product. All with in different companies, right? So it was HR in one company yeah. versus sales, okay. Correct. And then we started to interview them. Then we also segment them based on uh, size and segment. Like we focus specifically on cyber companies and big data and machine learning uh, related products because those products are relatively more complex with more with richer feature set, more API. So it's harder to kind of train and enable employees and customers using it. And second of all, also we wanted to understand uh, like, like whether we want to go more to the mid market or to the enterprise space based on the 
kind of get here, as we mentioned before, like time to value and pain point. And of course, the budget, that's also a key aspect. Who's, who's going to pay for it? Uh, now, I think one of the challenges when we started with Guide is from a product perspective, it can hit a lot of different use cases. Uh, mm -hmm. You can help product teams better communicate the, feature, the new feature to the field teams. You can help data scientists communicate with data engineers, and you can help sales reps to improve and scale their sales cycle. So I think one of the key elements was to pick uh, the ones that has the biggest pain point, but also have a problem that they, which is critical for them to fix and have the budget to address that. And when we started, we picked uh, three different, uh, I would say three different uh, design partners. Uh, one was more external use case around CSM and sales engineer. Other one was more internal use case, more about business operations. And the third one was about more like around system integrating, uh, sorry, the third one was about training agency and system integrators that needs to implement application as part of project and, and uh, their own end customer. And we tested out three types through like for like three months. And then we decided to focus on one of them just based on the, I will say, based on the engagement, based on the need, based on the rollout, we saw like, who has it like in this top of his priority on the list and who it helps the most. And today we, we focus mostly on go-to-market teams from the pre-sales side to the post-sales side to, and we saw like the KPIs and the business KPIs that customers that use users guide can actually reduce 50% of their support tickets and improve their response time or can shorten the trial period or the POC period from 12 weeks to four weeks. So you can actually quantify that the business value they get by using video. And, and of course, video is probably the closest format you can get to a human interaction without jumping on Zoom calls again and again and again, which is really not cost effective and, and not really make not useful of your time. How far along within the actual product journey or, or readiness, I would say, did you start engaging with your design partners? Did you already have something ready and out there and already, you know, potentially selling to customers while at the same time engaging with design partners? Or did you use them super early in when you're were actually building the product and only after you finish your conversations or your learning from them, did you roll it out for others? That's a great uh, question. I think based on our experience, uh, the fastest you get to the field, the, be the better it is because you can like develop six months, go to a customer and then find out you are totally off. So what we wanted to do, we kind of built the prototype within four to six weeks and it was like a half-baked product and started working with two de friendly design partners that we picked from the, from the previous like questionnaire and interviews we did. I think it took us about eight more weeks to work with them almost on a daily basis or like three times a week uh, calls to fine tune the product. And from their perspective, they got a lot of value because we can create a feature based on their needs. After like the first eight weeks, the product was like in an alpha phase. So we've added like four to six more design partners. And then after a total of three months, we started first to have our first paying customers, which most of them were from our design partners. And then we started to roll out gradually two, three customers every uh, few weeks until we opened it up uh, after around six, seven months. So it took us, it was like a gradual process. And throughout the process, we kept talking with all the customers, at least on a weekly basis, and a lot of the, I would say, features and stickiness of the product was as a result of feedback we got based on their feedback. Well, it's, there's so much more that we can speak about this. And I, I think like, I would love to dive deeper into this. I'm, I'm sure we'll be hosting some sort of webinar at some point about design partnerships. So I'll make sure to invite you yeah. back on that because this is such a, a, an important topic when it comes, especially at very early stage, um, startups, like how are they going to make sure that they're hitting the right pain points and how are they going to make sure they're getting to the right people? So I think it's 
huge, but I want to table it for now because I want to keep these conversations as short as possible. As you had mentioned, people don't really sit and want to watch an hour long <laughs> Zoom yeah. video. Um, what has surprised you when you were building, you know, right now, again, you're, you're still in the first year and a half or so, right, of Guide? Yeah. So what's what surprised you most? And this could be something either negative or positive um, when it came to building guide. Yeah, so I think it might sound obvious, but I think what most surprised me is the flexibility and the amount of choices you have in such an early stage and also the impact of each choice, like, like the, from the design partners that we just mentioned to the pricing model to the feature set and 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 the market like learning the market trends and acting based on the competitive landscape so i think it's something i experienced in all of my previous roles but the impact you have on on the decision and the short term wins versus the strategic goals has a huge impact uh, that it's in a, such an early stage each each decision is actually critical to the next phase and do you have any advice on how you came about making the right or what you learned from making the wrong decisions on that for, for maybe other founders? Yeah, I think probably one of the best advices that I got from one of our angel was to fail fast. Like <laughs> people always talk about their success stories. Nobody really talks about their failures. I think uh, you have very little data to back most of your decision at that stage. And most of the decision is either based on your like on the feedback you get from the customers or design partners based on your gut feeling and intuition also based on kind of market trends and and the landscape around you so i think uh part of the like iterative process we did in guide was we're building fast new capabilities showing it to the market getting feedback measuring the usage and the impact and we're not afraid to, to throw it away after a few weeks. So test it out, measure it. And, and again, don't get emotionally attached to it. And because the most focused you are, the better you are. So I think that's kind of probably uh, one of the best advice I got and we leverage it on a weekly basis. Now you were prior to you know, co-founding guide, you were the VP product of Gigaspaces, right? So you were you were pretty high up in an existing company. What would you say to founders that, or people really that are have an amazing idea, they've got even someone that is potential co-founder, they just haven't yet made that leap from, let's say running product at another company to being brave enough to start something of their own. So can you tell me a little bit about like, how did you know this was the right thing to leave your probably good job for? How did you decide that this is what you wanted to do? And what would you tell to any other aspiring very early stage founder or, or not yet founder, entre aspiring entrepreneur of how to make that jump? Any advice that you'd give them how to get started? So I think the best, probably the best advice I can gi I give is that uh, choosing the right team members is crucial. Like the, that's the best, uh, the most crucial piece of the puzzle when building the company because they, they will dictate the DNA of the company down the road. So selecting the right co-founder, the investor that has a huge impact and also the team member in the core team is crucial to the success, especially where during the, the journey you have a lot of ups and downs and you need everyone to be like 200% involved and engaged during the process. So yeah, invest in the team, that's gonna probably, I uh, will, be crucial in the next step. You had mentioned, you know, even choosing investors in that those early stages is really important. So, can you tell me a little bit about why Entree? How did you? How did, how did we end up uh, being chosen? How did we choose you? Tell me a little bit about the the why within our relationship. So, I think uh, one of our like mantras for, for Dan and I is always optimize for the people, not for the for the money. And and I think during the journey of a startup, there's a lot of ups and downs, and you're looking for an investor that will back you up uh, and be kind of a partner in the in the process. And we felt with Iran and the entire entry team, this mutual trust uh, that we can really work together as a as a team and it proved itself so far. And we're really like, I think enjoying their challenging us on our decision. They are giving us their advice based on other portfolio companies. So I think there's a lot of mutual uh, trust and also uh, 
we learn a lot from them. So I think that's something that uh, uh, proved itself in the last year or so since we started. To wrap this up, any books, podcasts, video recommendations that you would recommend that empowered you as a founder that you would suggest someone else, an aspiring founder or early stage entrepreneur uh, checks out? Yeah, so I think uh, probably one of the best books I read in the last few years is, is called Nordo to NASDAQ. Uh, it's not that famous. Uh, and I think um, it talks about the story from a founder perspective from the early 80s, someone that founded a, a company until the IPO in the early 90s, when back then there was no venture capital, so the stakes were higher. And it talks about the road and it wasn't that shiny, a lot of issues on the road, a lot of bumps. And I think any founder that has a vision, it, you can learn a lot how we pursue the vision. And it also combines uh, personal stories and also combines stories from the Israeli history throughout that period. So I think it's super interesting and had, had a really like personal connection to that book. So I really recommend anyone uh, that is interested of kind of getting mm -hmm a glimpse to how a founder life looks like uh, during a 10 years, 15 years, decade. Amazing. I will add it to our list and order it so we can have it on our bookshelf here at Entree. Um, any last things that you want to add before we wrap up? Because I think this was a great conversation. We're hitting, we're hitting the time limit here. I'm trying to keep under the, you know, I, I, I started this off thinking we can do this within 15 minutes. And then I got kind of carried away with the design partnerships conversation. Okay. <laughs> so here we're at 30. We'll try to keep it at 30. Anything else that we want to add before we close this? No, just thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity and the stage. And I think anyone that wants to connect, reach out to me on LinkedIn or Dan, and we'll be happy to kind of provide you more feedback and advice based on our experience. Amazing. Well, thank you all so much for joining me here today. And uh, I look forward to having an additional broader conversation on design partnerships so we'll be in touch we'll we'll do thank you faith Pleasure. thank you